Well, Pastor Jeff and I are doing a short series. He preached last week, and then I get to teach you this morning on the waiting room. It's uh, called God's Waiting Room, and, um, and it's just a short series we ended this week. Uh, you know, the waiting room is a place where you and I, it's a key to getting our miracle, but it can be a difficult place or it can be an amazing place for you. It could be the most difficult place or it could be the most amazing place, depending on how we are in God's waiting room. But the waiting room is the key to your miracle. It's the key to your blessing. Is the key to where God wants to get you next. It is his waiting room. And this morning, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you practical things. I'm going to give you five things to remember when you're in God's waiting room and one thing to do. It's going to get you to that blessing. You know, waiting, there's nothing more irritating in life than having to wait or frustrating. I mean, like, how many of you really like traffic? Does anybody here this morning like waiting in traffic? I don't see one hand. Do you like waiting at the grocery store? No, we choose the shortest line at the grocery store. And while we're standing in the shortest line, we're looking to see if there's another one that's shorter that might come available. Because we just don't like to wait. Waiting at Astroworld. Waiting used to be Astroworld. That dates me. How many went to Astroworld? After Sunday morning church, we took off and we enjoyed Astroworld every Sunday. We loved Astroworld. But no one likes to wait in line at Disney World, Astroworld. No, we get the fast pass. We choose the shortest line at the store. But technology has sped things up and made things faster, so it's made us more accustomed to fast. I mean, we pay extra money to get high-speed internet. Technology has made us more impatient than the farmer a hundred years ago, and so it's made it difficult for us in life. It's made us more impatient in life, and so, but patience is an important part of life. It's an important part of growing and character development as you're serving God. As you're in the waiting room, great things are happening in your life, and I'm going to show you this morning. There are some things that you only learn in waiting. You can't learn any other way but by waiting. Every child, though, it's important for every child to understand the difference, and it's important for every child of God to understand the difference between no and not yet. It's not the same. It's different. But an immature child doesn't understand the difference between no and not yet. They just think it means no, but God is not saying no. Many times he's saying not yet. But our unwillingness to wait is the cause of so many problems in our life, in our society, in our life, because we want it and we want it now, so we go ahead and buy it. It's the cause of all, most all debt in our life because we get it on credit. Even though we can't afford it, we get it on credit, and so debt mounts up. And it's why America is in debt. Uh, sexual diseases comes from the ability to delay uh, uh, sexual satisfaction till marriage and it's the cause of broken hearts and it's the cause of so many problems in our life uh, I want it and I want it now I heard Pastor Jeff said that last week he must have stole my notes so have you ever been in a hurry when God wasn't I mean because you can rush your kids but you can't rush God Nothing more frustrating than trying to rush God, and he's not in a hurry, but you are. And so it, it makes it challenging for us. At many times in our life, we've prayed a prayer, and it hasn't happened. We've been believing God. But you got to remember there's a difference between no and not yet. It's on the way. Charles told us this morning, it's on the way. Why does God delay things when he could answer our prayer immediately and right then? If God answered every prayer, every request that you ask immediately, you would just be an extremely selfish person. You would not have learned patience and endurance. Those things would have not worked in your life. You would treat God like a vending machine and you'd pull the lever and then boom, instantly it'd be there. God, I need this. Boom. There it is. 
But God's more concerned about you than he is the solution. He's more concerned about what's happening on the inside of you than he is you getting you what you desire. But he wants to give you the desires of your heart. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11, the New Century Version says, God does everything just right and on time, but people can never completely understand what he's doing. Well, duh. If we could, we would be God, and we are not. If we understood exactly what was, he was doing, we would not need to trust. I want to be practical and help you because you got to live life. And I want to help you in life. I want to help pastor you. So number one, five things to remember. Number two, what to do when we're in the waiting room. See, because waiting is faith. This is faith. Waiting is faith. Waiting is faith as much as taking initiative is faith. Waiting in a, is a matter of trust as much as taking a risk like Peter did and walking on the water. Waiting is as much faith as taking the risk. And so I'm going to give you five things when you've prayed a prayer and it hasn't had answer, been answered and you believe in God for the promise or whatever then there is five things you need to remember. Number one, remember there's a natural delay between planting and harvesting. A farmer doesn't go out and, and look out after he's planted the seed one day the next day and, and say, hey, where's my harvest? I, he doesn't go out expecting full-grown collard greens or cantaloupe or green onions or okra, a full-grown watermelon. My goodness, are you hungry now? There's always a delay between planting and harvesting, sowing and reaping. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 3.15, there is a time for everything and a season under heaven. Actually, uh, there is a time to plant and a time to harvest. And so there is, the, here the Bible is talking about seasons, that there are seasons in our life, and, and you always... Uh, uh, don't you, you always get the harvest season and a different season than the planting season and so you don't always plant and then come out and expect the harvest the next day no they don't happen in the same season so what I want you to say is this I reap in a different season than I sow just say it out loud I reap in a different season than I sow so many of you have felt like things have been delayed because you've planted seeds of faith, you've planted seeds of service, financial seeds, and you didn't see the harvest immediately. Don't be weary because harvest time happens at a different time than planting time. Amen? During the season of waiting, you need to wait expectantly. Wait patiently in faith. Don't wait in fear. No, wait in faith. Because there is a delay between planting and harvesting. The second thing you do re need to remember is there is an unseen battle. Charles already preached it for us. Thank you, Brother Charles. Say thank you, Brother Charles. There's an unseen battle that's going on, a spiritual war in the heavens. So when you have prayed a prayer, you have to understand that when you don't see it, there's something else happening in another realm. We don't see it, we don't feel that realm, but there is a heavenly realm around the earth. There is a cosmic heavenly realm. There is a spiritual war going on in that realm. In fact, in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, Paul talks about it. There is a battle between good and evil, a battle between God and Satan. There's a battle between angels and demons. And the fact is you and I are caught right in the middle of that battle. And as a child of God, Satan hates you. He wants to mess you up. And the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, that we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but we struggle against that heavenly spiritual realm where there is a spiritual darkness in heavenly places. There's rulers of darkness, and so there's a struggle going on. But Jesus has already de defeated the enemy for you, so you and I can fight the battle in faith. No, we've already won the victory. And so what this verse is saying is that when you send a prayer up, 
There is a battle going on. There's something happening to get that prayer to you. Sometimes God is having to move on people to bring a blessing to you, and they haven't said yes yet. There's something going on behind the scenes that you don't see that's bringing your answer to you. And so Satan starts throwing darts of you. That's the battle that's going on, is the darts of doubt, discouragement, disappointment, delay, depression. He's trying to get you to quit and give up. He's throwing these darts at you, but I want you to encourage you this morning. Don't quit. Don't give up. God is sending and has sent the answer already. The first day you prayed it, he sent the answer. So we may not see it. We may not know what's going on, but we get a glimpse of it in Daniel chapter 10. It's one time in the Bible where we see the spiritual war going on behind our prayers and what's happening. Daniel chapter 10, the angel shows up in a vision. He has, and, and he and says, Daniel, God loves you deeply. And I want you to know this morning, God loves you deeply. And God has heard your prayers. I've come here this morning to tell you God has heard your prayers. And then he says this. He says, from the first day that you humbled yourself, I've come to answer your prayers. But this kingdom of darkness has been blocking me and opposing me for 21 days. So Michael, the archangel, he had to come down. He intervened. He fought. And now he's here with the answer. Is that not the wildest verse you've ever seen? Wow, God pulls back the curtains and shows us what's going on behind your prayers just to help you in God's waiting room. So you can remember there's something going on. When you remember that, then you can wait expectantly and you can wait patiently and then you can know that no that's not just not yet doesn't uh, mean no it means not yet amen so the bible tells us that daniel had a prayer he wasn't that wasn't answered he starts getting discouraged but this angel shows up and he says hey listen from first day you prayer pray the prayer i've come to tell you and i'm telling you i've come down to tell you the answer is here it's on its way and i'm telling you this morning for you the prayers you've prayed the answer is on its way god heard you the first day you prayed it a delay does not mean a denial god's not saying no Many times he's not saying no. No, he's just saying it's on the way. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's on the way. There's just a war happening. So number three, the third thing I want you to remember is, is that God is also preparing me for the blessing. So in God's waiting room, I'm growing. I'm growing in character and endurance. I'm gro my faith is growing. The Bible says your faith can grow exceedingly in Thessalonians. So when you, when you have an idea of what you're believing God for, uh, the Bible says God has a bigger idea. So just, I just want to throw that in. Ephesians 3.20, he wants to do exceedingly abundantly of more than we can even ask or think. So when God's sending it, it's going to be bigger. But, uh, but we need to know that something's happening. Something uh, through the time of waiting, there is something happening in you. We got to remember that God's preparing you for the blessing. He's preparing you. He's growing you. In fact, in the Bible, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though it is necessary for you to endure trials, delays, testings, that these trials and tests... They're testing your faith, showing that it is strong and pure. It's testing your faith, and your faith is being purified. Just as fire tests and purifies gold, and your faith also is more precious than gold, it is being tested and coming out pure as gold. So some of you are going through a fiery time. Some of you are going through a tough time. Keep going. As you're going, you are growing, you are abounding, you are learning endurance, your character is growing. Wonderful things are happening. So when you're praying for something and it hasn't happened and you're in God's waiting room waiting for something and you're in that time zone, just know that there's a season that's coming and it's a season of harvest. Trust God, have faith, believe God, keep enduring. 
In fact, Paul describes this time where God is developing you and he's preparing you and growing you. He, he compares it in Romans chapter 8, verse 24, to a woman that's pregnant. And she's going to have a baby. And, and here Paul tells us in the scripture there, here he says, waiting does not diminish us. Any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. Just because your prayer hasn't been answered doesn't mean that you're being diminished or God doesn't want to answer your prayer or you're not as spiritual as Sister Susie. No, you are in the waiting room and it does not diminish you any more than it diminishes a pregnant woman. No, we are enlarged in the waiting. Have you ever seen a pregnant woman? She gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We don't see what's enlarging us as we wait, but the longer that we wait, the larger we become and the more expectant that we become. Meanwhile, the scripture goes on to say, when you get tired in the waiting, God's spirit is right alongside. He's helping you along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He prays in us and for us. God's Spirit is praying in you and for you. Don't worry if you don't even know what to pray. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, and He knows our pregnant condition. Wow. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives is working into something good. God is working it out for the good. Whatever's happening in your life, he's working it out for the good and better than you even ask or think or could even imagine. My goodness, just wait and wait expecting. Like a pregnant mom waits. They don't call it expectancy for nothing. No, because you're expecting it. You are being enlarged. Number four, the fourth thing you need to remember when you're in God's waiting room is you're in good company. Millions of saints who have gone on before you have been in God's waiting room. All of them. All of them who were men and women of faith. So you're not alone. In fact, if you're in the waiting room waiting for a job, waiting for a better job, waiting for an answer to prayer, waiting for whatever you need, whatever in your life is the next thing, then there's a lot of, no, there's a lot of other people around you that are sitting in the same situation in God's waiting room. So you're not alone in God's waiting room. You've got to remember that. And they have the millions of saints who have gone on before you that have waited. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 the King James Version says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It by the elders obtained, they obtained, by, the, by it, the elders obtained a good report. And then verse 2 in the Children's Bible International says, People who lived in the past became famous because of their faith. And every one of these people waited on God. They sat in God's waiting room. Hannah, Hannah waited in God's waiting room. She prayed for a baby. She waited and prayed and believed God, and God gave her baby Samuel, gave her God's prophet, the greatest prophet, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. Joseph waited in God's waiting room. God gave him a dream that he would rule. At a very young age, he received this dream, but he ended up in prison for 14 years for a crime that he did not commit. He was falsely accused. He was in God's waiting room, but the Bible says he told his brothers, you meant this for my evil, God meant it for my good. While he was even in prison, the Bible says he was joyful and happy, and the other prisoners looked at him perplexed and said, why are you so happy because he was waiting expectantly in God's waiting room God had prepared him to rule Egypt Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness knowing God's purpose for his life he was in the waiting room for the assignment that God had for him that's when God showed up in a burning bush and he wanted Moses to lead his people to freedom Moses was being grown and he was being developed in God's waiting room. Abraham waited for 25 years to have the son Isaac, the miracle son, the, the, the child of promise. But um, Abraham was 75 years old when God gave him the promise. He didn't have Isaac till he was 100 years old. And so he became the father of faith, though, when he did Finally, his wife birthed Isaac. Noah waited for 120 years till it, you know, waited for it to rain, built the ark. That is a long time. Some of you think you've been waiting a long time, but look at Brother Noah. 
built an ark, waited for it to rain. It never rained before. Can you only imagine? God waited thousands of years before sending the Messiah. God's not in a hurry, and neither should we be. Our society has caused us to be in a hurry, and we've got to learn to wait on God and learn to get in God's rhythm rather than the world's rhythm. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 15 says, After waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised to him, but the waiting was essential in faith. You and I can enjoy God's waiting room. We can learn not to be in a hurry, and we can wait for the promise. Keep believing. Keep praying. Don't give up. Just like the lady in Luke chapter 14, uh, 18, the widow woman, she kept believing and kept going to the unjust judge, kept knocking and saying, Adventure my, my adversaries. God said that's how we should pray and always pray and never stop praying. The fifth thing you should remember when you're in God's waiting room is God always keeps his promises. People may not keep their promises to you. You may have been let down, but God always keeps his promises. He always comes through. You can count on him. He will keep his promises. You can count on God. He stakes his reputation on it. If he said he would do it, he will do it. He's not a man that he should lie. No, if he promised it, he will do it, and he will do it right on time. He did it for Sarah. Even though Sarah got in the flesh and Abraham, even though they got in the flesh, God still showed up like he said he was going to show up and gave him the promised child. You and I just got to keep believing. So when you're in the waiting room, don't focus on the fact that you may not have all the talent you think you should have or the fact that you don't have the, all the connections that you believe you need or, or you ha don't have all the money that you believe you need or the opportunities. No, you don't focus on what you don't have. You need to focus on God's promises and what he has. Don't focus on your inability. Focus on God's ability because he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. Anything is possible with God if we'll put our faith in Him, the Bible says, and He will do it right on time at His time. Habakkuk 2, 3, God says, at the time I have decided my words will come true. You can trust what I say about the future. It may take a long time, but keep on waiting. It will happen. God said it will happen, and it will happen. I came here this morning with a word from God to tell you it will happen. Don't give up. Don't quit. God is right on time. He's never early, and he's never late, but he is always right on time. He might be early sometime. The reaper does overtake the sower sometime. Amen? There's over 7,000 promises in God's, in the Word of God, and, and, and we are, as we're waiting on those promises, it's so important while we're in God's waiting room that we memorize the promises. Memorize Scripture. When you're in God's waiting room, memorize the Word of God. It feeds your faith. It builds you up while you're waiting on a job, while you're waiting on an answered prayer. Memorize Scripture. When you wake up tomorrow morning, decide what Scripture you're going to memorize. Say, I'm going to memorize this scripture this week. It's a good time to memorize scripture when you're in God's waiting room. And then, and then, and then I'm going to move into the next section, which is the one thing you should do when you're waiting in God's waiting room. Aren't you glad whenever you're in waiting rooms, they have coffee and all that good stuff? How many of you like to wait in the waiting room? Man, it's just not fun. But God can give you a peace that passes all understanding that you can have in the waiting room. And so while you're in the waiting room, let's memorize scripture so we can focus on God's promises. But then there's one thing you need to do. Five things to remember. We talked about them. That there's natural delay between the planting and harvesting. Number two, there's something happening in the unseen realm. We don't see a war going on. Number three is you're growing, you're preparing while you're in the waiting room. Number four, you're in good company. Millions of saints have done this. And number five, always remember God keeps his promises. And then what we need to do in God's waiting room is act as if it's already happened. When you have deposited a seed, whatever the seed is, a talent in service, a seed of energy, a financial seed, a seed of a prayer, whatever seed it is, when you have planted a seed, you need to act as if it has already happened. When you're waiting for the seed to grow, you need to be like a farmer is. 
expecting for that to come up, expecting for that miracle, that answer, expecting for that answer to prayer to happen. But usually in the waiting rooms in life, this is what we do. We wonder and we worry and we whine in the waiting room. We wonder, wonder, we wonder, Lord, uh, why, God, why am I here? Why, Lord, why am I here? And then we worry, how are you going to do it, God? How are you going to do it? And then we just worry. And then we whine, when, Lord, when am I going to have this promise? When is this prayer going to be answered? When am I going to have this baby? And instead of worrying and whining, the Bible says you, can, you should act like it's already happened. Act like you already got it. Act in faith. Jesus said this way, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, Jesus said, I tell you, whatever things you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, past tense, that you have received it, it's already happened, and it will, future tense, be yours. Notice the two tenses. Believe that you have received it past tense and it will be yours future tense. So what in the world is Jesus saying here? Is he saying that I need to believe I already got it in order to get it? Yes, that's exactly what he's saying. Is he saying that I need to believe that it is so even though it's not so, so it will be so? That's exactly what Jesus is saying. So when you thank God for the answer, after you've had the answer, that's gratitude. But you and I in prayer can act in faith and we can thank God for the answer after we planted the seed before it happens. That's when we believe we receive it before it is ours. Every pregnant woman does this. Every pregnant woman who carries a baby inside of her body, she does this. She's expecting. She's believing she's going to receive. She acts like she has it before she already gets it. She goes out and gets clothes for that baby. She gets diapers for the baby. She gets a baby bed. She, the baby, she doesn't wait till the baby's born and think, oh, I got to get something for this little, this little precious little angel to wear. I got to change the diaper. No, she's preparing for it because she is expecting it to happen before it already happens. She's expecting to have the baby. You should do this when you're waiting for something, whatever you're waiting for. Maybe you're looking for a job and waiting for a job, a better job, a good job. Maybe you just need a job and you're believing for a job. Act like you already have it. So what you do is you study and prepare. Bring out, you know, study and look up some things that, that, that you may need to know in the job you're going to be doing, that you're believing God for. Uh, study several things. Or instead, of, instead of sleeping in in the morning, set your alarm and get up like you got the job. Don't sleep in. Amen? Get dressed like you got the job and, and then study your notes. But act like you already got it. Amen? That's called... That's called expectantly waiting, not passively waiting. Waiting in faith is not passivity, no. You, you do all you can do to get ready. And so there's a difference between passively waiting in fear, like, oh, and, and, and apathy, and expectantly waiting in faith, where you take action and, and you get prepared like it's already happened. And so God does this. God did this with Abraham. And so when God told Abraham, he spoke over him. He said, I've called you to be the father of many nations. Abraham was 75. It took 25 years for him to have a baby. God changed his name. From Abram to Abraham, Ham. He added the name of God to it, Ha. His name, which is, which is, uh, which is the, uh, the giver of life. God's the giver of life. And so he became Abraham. He became the father of many nations. So for 25 years, Abraham walked around and introduced himself, not as Abram, but as Abraham. And so we didn't meet people in town, it, you know, tell them his name. My name is Father of Many Nations. Oh, really? You have a lot of children. How many children do you have? None. Well, how old are you? A hundred years old. Interesting. Can you imagine that? So Abraham was living a life of faith. Romans 4, 7 said, God called those things that were not as though they were. That's called faith. Everything God created, he spoke into existence and called those things that were not as though they were.
He calls things that are not as though they are. He says to Abraham, you're the father of a great nation. He hadn't had any kids at this time, but God's calling him Abraham. God looked at Gideon. He's in the wine press. He's hiding. He's cowardly. He's weakly. And God calls Gideon out, and he says, get up, mighty man of valor. I've called you to deliver my people. And then he says to Peter, who's shifty, Peter, who's impulsive, Peter, who is always saying stuff, you know, before he should say it, sticking his foot in his mouth, cutting, cutting the ear off of the soldier, and Jesus has to pick the ear up and put it back on because he's so shifty and so impulsive. Jesus looks at him and says, you're Petra, you're a rock, Peter. Peter did become that rock. God speaks things into existence before they are. He wants us to do the same with our children, with our family, with the things we're believing God for, we're trusting Him for. He wants us to do the same. But God has timing. He wants us to trust His timing. He's never early. He's never late. But He's always right on time. That's why it's so important for us to learn to trust God in the waiting room and enjoy it. It may take longer than you expect, but in closing, I want to tell you what it's like. It's like the bamboo tree. You cut a piece of bamboo off of a bamboo tree, and you stick it in the ground, and you water it for the first year, nothing happens. You water it for the second year, come back and water it the second year, keep watering all year long, and nothing happens. Third year, you water it again, nothing happens. The fourth year, the fifth year, you fertilize it, and you water it the sixth year, and nothing happens. Can you imagine? But finally, you're watering it in the seventh year. Amazingly, it explodes out of the ground. And in one day, it grows three feet. Most bamboo trees, they grow up to nine feet in three to four days. Explosive growth. Wow. This is how it is with God. When God does something, he does it suddenly, and it happens. It happens in his timing. You're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, and all of a sudden, it sprouts. It takes off. And my goodness, it takes off in explosive growth. I want you to know that's how it is with you as you're in God's waiting room. You're believing God. You've been working on it. You've been working on it. You've been believing. You've been tithing. You've been planting. You may be in your sixth year. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep holding on because there is something explosive about to take place and sprout in your life. That answer is coming. That miracle is coming. Just keep trusting God. You may be in the third year. Well, I'm telling you, Pastor Jeff and I are going to be there to tell you don't give up, don't get discouraged, don't quit, keep believing God. We'll come if we have to, and we will beat you with a noodle or something to tell you keep believing, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. You may be in the fourth year, the fifth year, who knows what year you're in. I'm so glad that in the darker year of my life that I still waited on God. I'm so glad I didn't give up. I'm so glad, but I'm even more glad that God did not give up on me. He never gives up on you. He always holds to his promises. He is a true God who will do everything he said that he would do. And he knew what he was going to do in my life. He knows what he's going to do in your life. I had no idea. But he knew during the dark days, keep trusting God. Keep serving. Keep doing what you know to do. Keep doing what the Word of God says to do. Do the basic obedient things that God's Word says do. And in Psalms 56, even when you're afraid in the dark days, Psalms 56.3 David said, I'm going to keep trusting you. Even though it looks dark, doesn't look like anything's going to happen, <laughs> looks like it's all over with, even in those times, just have daring faith and keep believing God. Some of you have been waiting on God, and he's waiting on you to keep believing him in faith. Don't, 
Don't let fear knock on your door and get you to answer. What you need to do is if fear knocks on the door and you're in God's waiting room, send faith to answer the door and no one will be there. Don't ever go answer fear's door. Leave that door shut because there's another door God's about to open up for you. And it is a door of blessing. It's an automatic door that as you are waiting in his waiting room and walking in faith, preparing for what God's prepared for you, it's an automatic door that opens up at the right time for you. Let's stand up this morning. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your blessings, your goodness. I thank you, Lord, Father, that you have great things for your people through every season in their life. I thank you, Lord, through every step in their life, whatever they're believing for, for a child, if they're believing for a job, if they're believing for a miracle, if they're believing for a healing in their body, you are the healer. You are Jehovah, you, uh, Rapha, our healer. I thank you, Lord, that you are also Jehovah Jireh, our provider. I thank you, Lord, for every blessing blessing and every financial need this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you, Father, have heard their prayer for the first day they prayed it. And I thank you, Lord, that that blessing and that need, that you are sending the answer. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. We can believe you that you are a God that can be trusted. I thank you, Lord, you're working out things better and more than we can even ask, think, or imagine. And we trust you with the answer. It may not be exactly what we think should have happened, but we thank you, Lord. We can trust you. You know what's best for us. You know what's best for our life. You know what's best for our journey. You know what's best for where we're going. And I thank you, Lord, you're leading us into your goodness, that your goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. I thank you, Lord, that you, Father, have only good things for your people. You know the plans you have for us of good and not evil, plans to prosper us plans to give us a, an expected hope and an end, one that we are expecting and we can't wait for it. That's the kind of God you are. You are El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. Thank you, God, for being altogether lovely and wonderful. You have been so wonderful in my life, and I thank you, Lord, that you, Father, show your goodness in all of our lives in an abounding way, in a way that we are just wowed over. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen, amen. I want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe there's somebody here that hasn't asked Christ to come into their life. They don't know him as their personal Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you're here this morning and you say, you know what, if I die today, I'm not sure where I would go. I don't know if I would go to heaven. You can be sure. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus died on the cross openly for you. And he wants you to know that he has made a way for you to have eternal life and a home in heaven. If you'll accept him as your Savior, he will give you eternal life. It's real simple. You don't have to work for it or earn it. No, you just simply receive it. It's a gift from God, something you can't pay to get. You can't pay for it. You never could pay for salvation. It's something that's a free gift from God. You receive it from Him, and then you work good works because you love Him so much. So if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ in your life, and you feel God tugging on you, the Bible says no man can come into Christ unless the Father draw him, and He's drawing you this morning. So if He's drawing you, I want to pray a prayer with you so you can accept Him into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. So this morning, if you'll just repeat after me, if you're here this morning and you want to pray that prayer, maybe you've been away from God. Maybe there's somebody here this morning, you've been away from God. You've been like the prodigal son, you've gone away from God. I want you to know you can come back home. The father received the son back home. He put a ring on his finger, a robe on him. And he brought him right back into the home. I want you to know you can run right back to God. He's been looking for you. He's been waiting for you. He is running to you. When you take that first step, he, run, he is running to you like the Father ran. It's the only time in the Bible where we see God ran. He's running to you this morning. I just want you to say that prayer with me. Let's say the prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin and wash me in your blood. Make me new in you. I will serve you all the days of my life and live for you. I make you Lord of my life, every area of my life, and I enjoy your waiting room. 
In Jesus' name, amen.